Good evening and welcome to our service of worship here in Stromillas Evangelical Presbyterian Church. It's good to be together online and it's really good to worship our great God. Well, we're going to commence our service by singing together. Uh, we're going to sing from this really well-known hymn, I'll praise my maker while I've breath, and when my voice is lost in death, praise shall employ my nobler powers. My days of praise shall not be passed while life and thought and being last, or immortality endures. Let's sing to God's praise together. Let us pray. Our God and our Father, we come into your presence and we thank you for the truths of this hymn that we have just been singing. We confess and we rejoice that you are our maker. 
Father, you are the uncreated God, the eternal being. You have no beginning. You will have no end. You have always been before the mountains and the hills were ever formed from everlasting to everlasting. You are God. And how, our Father, we thank you for this truth that you are the sovereign creator and sustainer of this world. Lord, we come to you as your creatures. We confess that you are just infinitely above us. Your mind is unsearchable. Your ways are beyond finding out. And yet we thank you that you, the the God who needed no one and nothing, that you, the God who was in a relationship and still are in a relationship of utter joy in the persons of the Godhead, Yet you created everything we see and at the pinnacle of your creation were human beings made in your image. And so our Father, we praise you as our maker tonight as we've just sung. You are our maker and we thank you that you are. And yet, Lord, we confess that as our maker, we've turned away from you. We've rebelled against you. We've answered you incorrectly. And we come with hearts that are heavy and burdened by sin. And yet we thank you that in the gospel you have made a way for sinners like us to be forgiven. And now you've opened our eyes, as this hymn puts it, uh, you've, uh, you've given eyesight to the blind. You've supported the fainting mind. And we thank you, our God, that you've done that, that in the gospel you have shone the light of your grace in the face of Jesus Christ. You've opened our eyes to see our need of him, our saviour and redeemer. Father, we, we praise you for him. What love he had for us and what love he has for us, that he would ever come to earth Veil his glory in the flesh of our humanity. Live in this sin-stained world. That he would come and place himself under the law. That he would come and be despised by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And yet he would come out of love for sinners like us. Father, we can hardly understand it. And we cannot take it in what it meant for thee, the Holy One, Lord Jesus, to bear away our sin. But how we thank you that you have. And that in the gospel, there is therefore now no condemnation for us who are in Christ Jesus that we stand before you tonight as children before a father, that we stand before you tonight clothed in robes of righteousness, that we stand before you tonight justified in your sight, those who will be, who will be glorified with you, that one day we will be face to face with Jesus. How we thank you for these truths how they spur us on and thrill our hearts. And Father, we confess that so often these truths have just become too familiar to our hearts. And we pray that tonight, by your grace and through your word, as your spirit ministers to us, that he would make them fresh and new, that our hearts would be touched by them again. Lord, please be with our congregation. We so miss one another. And we... We think of those who are going through difficult and hard times at the minute. Please, Father, be with them and help them. Especially we think of those who continue to mourn the loss of loved ones. And Father, we, we can't understand their pain, but we thank you that you have been on this earth in the person of your son, Jesus. And you've tasted what it is to feel grief and sorrow. And so we come to you through Christ, our sympathetic high priest, and we plead with you on our friend's behalf. 
And Lord, we too pray for those who have been sick in the congregation and are having to self-isolate. And we pray that you'd encourage them and uphold them. And be too, Lord, with those who are rejoicing the arrival of family members, children or grandchildren, and those who are looking back at your kindness over many years. Please help them and please let these times be joyful. We rejoice with them in their joy, our Father. And we pray not only for our own congregation, but for our nation and land. And we pray that you would help us be with our government, help our NHS workers, be with those who will return to work, your uh, essential workers, and those who will be readying themselves to return to work soon. Help our country as we seek to come to some sense of normality in these next few weeks and months. Help us, Lord. Give us wisdom and grace. And most of all, may we turn to you, the living God. Uh, Father, we are mindful that there are other lands in desperate need of your help. And uh, we do particularly pray for the United States of America this evening. We pray that you would bring peace on that land. Oh, our God, how we pray for it. So, our Father, we pray that you would help us and be with us in this service to worship you from our hearts, to treasure and honour you, to be true worshippers, those who worship the Father in spirit and truth. And we pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, let's turn in God's word now together. Uh, we're going to turn to the book, back to the book of First Kings. First Kings. Um, we're turning tonight to chapter 18. Uh, First Kings, chapter 18. And we're going to read the first 19 verses of this passage. Let us hear the word of God. After many days, the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go, show yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. So Elijah went to show himself to Ahab. Now the famine was severe in Samaria. And Ahab called Obadiah, who was over the household. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. And when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord, Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by fifties in a cave and fed them with bread and water. And Ahab said to Obadiah, go through the land to all the springs of water and to all the valleys. Perhaps we may find grass and see if the horses and mules alive and not lose some of the animals. So they divided the land between them to pass through it. Ahab went in one direction by himself and Obadiah went in another direction by himself. And as Obadiah was on the way, behold, Elijah met him. And Obadiah recognized him and fell on his face and said, Is it you, my lord Elijah? And he answered him, It is I. Go, tell your lord, behold, Elijah is here. And he said, How have I sinned that you would give your servant into the hand of Ahab to kill me? As the Lord your God lives, there is no nation or kingdom where my lord is not sent to seek you. And when they would say, he is not here, he would take an oath of the kingdom or nation that they, that they had not found you. And now you say, go, tell your Lord, behold, Elijah is here. And as soon as I have gone from you, the spirit of the Lord will carry you, I know not where. And so when I come and tell Ahab and he cannot find you, he will kill me. Although I, your servant, have feared the Lord from my youth. Has it not been told my Lord what I did? When Jezebel killed the prophets of the Lord, how I hid a hundred men of the Lord's prophets by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water. And now you say, go, tell your Lord, behold, Elijah is here and he will kill me. And Elijah said, as the Lord of hosts live, before whom I stand, I will surely show myself to him today. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. When Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, Is it you, you troubler of Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you have, and your father's house, because you have abandoned the commandments of the Lord and followed the Baals. Now therefore send and gather all Israel to me at Mount Carmel and the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. Amen. And we thank God for his word. 
We come tonight to our fourth study in the life of Elijah. So far, as you know, we've seen a little bit of the, 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 the times, the context in which Elijah lived and spoke in. We've seen that encounter with the widow of Zarephath, how she came to faith, and how then God developed and stretched and grew her faith through this awful providence of the death and then wonderfully the resurrection of her son. Well, as we come into chapter 18, there have been three long years of drought and famine, three and a half years. We have had about three scorching weeks of weather there over the last little while. And the grass is beginning to look a bit yellow and in need of rain. Just imagine for a moment what Israel would have looked like. The farmers would have been desperate for rain. People would have been frantically looking for food. Now, verse 2 tells us that the famine was severe, severe in the capital city of Israel, Samaria. Well, as we come into this chapter, verse 1, Elijah is sent to confront Ahab. He is sent by God to remind Ahab as this drought and famine is about to end why the famine and the drought were sent. And we're going to encounter three people in particular as we move through these verses. Uh, We're going to see Obadiah. And in Obadiah, we're going to see a man who is doubting God. Here's someone who had been very courageous for God. But now he is fearful of Ahab. He is doubting God. God. Secondly, we're going to see Ahab. And in Ahab, we're going to see a king, a king blaming God, a king blaming God. And there's great irony in the the example of Ahab. He's rejected God, pushed him out of society, doesn't really want anything to do with him. But now that tragedy and crisis has hit, he is quick to point the finger of blame at God for this drought and famine. And then thirdly, we're going to consider Elijah. And in Elijah, we're going to see a prophet, a prophet representing God, speaking God's word courageously and boldly into this situation. So we've got a man, a king, and a prophet. A man, a king, and a prophet. Let's see this man, Obadiah, first of all, a man who is doubting God. A man doubting God. Now, I want to nail my colours to the mast straight away and tell you that I think Obadiah is a wonderful character. I'm not here to point my finger at him in that heading, but I do want to reflect what is going on in his life. Here is a faithful and a courageous man, but someone who is beginning to doubt God. Verse 3 tells us an awful lot about him. Just look at it with me. Ahab called Obadiah, who was over his household, He had an important job. He's a manager, an administrator. If you like, he's the head of the Israeli civil service. He's in an influential and important role in this country and society. And he's there at an important time, a time of national crisis when there would have been much administration, lots to do. He's seen firsthand how Ahab has ruled Israel, the slide and the decay into a greater and greater godlessness in this society. He's watched on as Jezebel has introduced the Baal worship, as it's pervaded society, as the common people have been taken up with this cultic form of religion. Now that can't have been easy for Obadiah, because if we read on in verse 3, we read, Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. He is a Christian. He is someone who loves God, and he loves God greatly. That word in the original is emphatic. He really loves God. Notice that uh, the second half of verse 3 and all of verse 4 are in brackets if you're reading in the ESV. Uh, And it's in a sense as though the camera has panned to Obadiah, but now the narrator's voice begins to speak over the top of our scene telling us a bit of what Obadiah is like, or text pops up to give us a bit of background about him. He loves God greatly. And here is Israel, the nation at a time of spiritual decay, darkness, and bankruptcy. And here is a man who loves the Lord greatly. Here is light in the palace. Here is what we want, a Christian in an influential position. 
That is encouraging, isn't it, if we just stop there for a moment? Because Israel, so far in the time of Elijah, has been painted as a dark and godless place. And in some ways, it's only seemed as though it's only Elijah who is a shining light for God. But actually, God has people throughout. He's got people throughout Israel in strategic roles and jobs like this. And no doubt, he's got people in mundane jobs as well. God is in control in this dark, godless land. Uh, And right from the outset, Obadiah is teaching us that serving God, serving God doesn't necessarily mean having an important job, being a prophet like Elijah, or even a civil servant like Obadiah. Serving God is much more about being faithful to God wherever he has placed us. It may be as a grade three or permanent secretary in the civil service. Uh, But it may be doing something much more mundane or humble. Maybe stacking shelves or cleaning toilets. It may be performing surgery or managing a business. It may be writing books, but it may be reading them to others, to your children. God isn't really so much interested in what we do. God is interested in how we do it. He calls us to be faithful. And Obadiah has been faithful. He's been faithful as God has used him in his particular role in life. Look at verse 4, and we see there a little bit of background to him, how faithful he has been. We read there, When Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord, Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by fifties in a cave and fed them with bread and water. Jezebel who loves these prophets of Baal, has come through the land searching out the prophets of the Lord. And she has cut them off. In other words, she has slaughtered them. You see, she wasn't content to simply introduce the worship of her gods, Baal, as one option among many in this society. No, she wanted Baal worship to be enforced and to be exclusive. But Obadiah has acted so bravely. He reminds us of so many people throughout church history, of Gladys Aylward, or the Corey Ten Booms, or the Amy Carmichaels of this world, who God has used to protect others. And Obadiah has taken 100 of these prophets, he split them into two groups of 50, he's hidden them in a cave or caves, and it's not just been a one-off kind of brave act, he's come back time after time, to feed them, supply them with bread and water as Jezebel goes throughout this land, searching them out so that she can cut them off. And what has driven Obadiah to this act of bravery is his fear, his great fear of God. He is someone who treasures the Lord. But, but, Now, Obadiah is beginning to doubt God. Ahab is desperate to find water, and we're going to think about that just in a minute. He's so desperate, in fact, that his plan is that he and Obadiah will go throughout the country and look for water personally. He'll go one way, Obadiah will go the other. And as Obadiah looks, behold, we're told, verse 7, Elijah meets him. He comes across Elijah. Go and tell your Lord, Elijah says. Here is Elijah. And on hearing those words, Obadiah begins to panic. You see, Ahab is looking everywhere for Elijah. He's a wanted man. There's posters up. There's a bounty on his head. There would be, in our day, TV ads, uh, pop-ups on your internet browser. He'd be on Crime Watch for Crimes Against the State. Ahab has sent delegations to other countries to look for Elijah. And when they have have said, no, he's not here, he's made them take an oath that they are not harboring this fugitive, this wanted man of Israel. And so Obadiah thinks to himself, well, hold on a minute. If I go and tell Ahab, I find you, but then uh, the Spirit of the Lord takes you somewhere else. And I bring you to this place and you're not here. Ahab's going to kill me, Elijah. Can't you see the danger that you're putting me in? In fact, Elijah, 
what have I done? Have I done some sin that you want to place me in this dangerous place? Haven't you heard, Elijah, of what I did, how I hid the prophets in those caves? He's doubting God and his word as it comes to him through God's prophet Elijah. Now, what has caused this brave, courageous, faithful man who's taken extraordinary risk for God to move now and to begin to doubt God? Let me suggest that it's this. It's that Ahab has become big in Obadiah's mind. And God has become small in Obadiah's heart. You see, he's seen the extent of Ahab's military search. He's felt at close and first hand the intense hatred that Ahab has for Elijah and for the faithful servants of the Lord. He has seen Jezebel at her table with the prophets of Baal and Asherah. He has witnessed the people in this land and how they have gone after the Baal gods. He's seen famine and drought for three years and now Ahab has become big in his mind, an object, a man to fear. And God, by contrast, has become small. The famine has dragged on. Perhaps he's begun to think to himself, where is God? How could God abandon us? How could God leave us like this? You see in verses 11 to 12 in his response to Elijah that he has forgotten that God's Spirit always acts in a way that is consistent with God's Word. Look at what he says in verse 11. And now you say, go tell your Lord, behold, Elijah is here, the Word of God. And as soon as I've gone away from you, the Spirit of the Lord will carry you I know not where. God's Spirit is going to act in a way that goes against God's Word. God has become small in Obadiah's mind. And while in verses 12 and 13 he is recounting all that he has done for the Lord, he's forgotten all that God has done for him. Ahab has become big, and God has become small. Now, there's a temptation in your mind right now, as there's a temptation in my mind, to look down on Obadiah. But please don't. Because how often is Obadiah just like you? Are you just like Obadiah? And how often am I just like Obadiah? We need courage, don't we, in the Christian life? We need courage in our workplaces to say no, to speak up, to reach out. Young people, you need courage in school or university to go to see you when other people are going to see you, to put your hand up in class when there's a question that's going to reveal that you are a Christian. Parents, you need courage, don't you, to to bring up your children in a countercultural way that's different to your neighbours, perhaps your relatives. And sometimes we have courage, and yet so often our courage seems to disappear very quickly. It's there one minute, and then it's gone the next. We're full of faith one day, and then we're dogged by doubt the next. Why? Why are we like this? Well, it's the same reason as Obadiah, because people or circumstances have become big in our minds, and because God has become small in our hearts. Isn't the Bible just full of stories like that? Abraham courageously leaves Ur. He goes to a place where he doesn't know where God is calling him. But it's not long before he's down in Egypt, lying about Sarah, saying she is his sister and not his wife. We see young David fighting Goliath when no one else in all of Israel would. But it's not long before this prince, this king in waiting, is faking mental illness before the king of the Philistines. We see Peter in the New Testament, and he's there with Jesus in the garden. He's cutting off the servant of the high priest's ear one minute, and the next minute he's in the courtyard denying the Lord Jesus to a servant girl. Where does courage come from? It comes from God being big. 
Look at how Elijah encourages Obadiah. Verse 15. And Elijah said, Ask the Lord of hosts lives. Ask the Lord of hosts lives. Ask Jehovah Sabaoth, the Lord who has legions of angels at his disposal, the Lord who is the Lord of hosts. He lives. He is. God lives. This is what Elijah wants to stir Obadiah's faith with. He wants to fill his mind with theological truth that then he would be able to go out in confidence and faith. He wants to make God big in Obadiah's mind that doubts would be dispelled, that courage can return. It's what we see David doing in Psalm 54 to himself. There he's chased by Saul. And some people, the Ziphites, have gone and turned him in to Saul and told him where he is hiding. And he says, O God, verse 1, Save me by your name, by all that you are. Vindicate me by your might. O oh God, hear my prayer. Give ear to the words of my mouth. I'm clinging on to you, God. You're mighty and glorious. Your name is great. This is who you are. And he's recalling all that God has done. 4, verse 7. He has delivered me from every trouble. And my eye in the past has looked in triumph on my enemies. And so I can dispel doubt. I can move forward in faith. John Calvin says, There can be no courage in men unless God supports them by his word. This is what we need, brothers and sisters, to fill our minds with truth about God revealed in his word. Here's a man doubting God because Ahab has become big and God has become small. How we need to keep God as great in our minds and hearts. So that's a man. Uh, secondly, I want you to see a king. A king. I'm thinking here about Ahab. And we see a king blaming God. We see a king blaming God. In my old workplace, the company I used to work for, there were a few characters a bit like Ahab, and, and maybe there's a few characters in your workplace a bit like this. Anything good that was done around the office? Well, well, maybe not anything, but lots of good things that were done around the office. All of a sudden, they would be there. They'd be looking for praise. They'd be exaggerating their role. They'd be ensuring that they got credit. But when something went wrong, suddenly they were invisible. They were nowhere to be seen. It was nothing to do with them. They were washing their hands very publicly of it. I'm sure you've come across people like that. And perhaps at times we can all be a bit like that in our hearts. But this is the second thing I want you to notice from these verses. It's the irony that we see in the life of Ahab and that we see in the world all around us. People who reject God are often the first to point their finger at God when something goes wrong. We see this very clearly in Ahab's life. The famine is severe. So severe that Ahab the king goes out personally to look for water. But as he goes, I want you to notice his priorities in verse 5. Ahab said to Obadiah, Go through the land, to all the springs of water, and to all the valleys. Perhaps we may find grass and see if the horses and mules alive and not lose some of the animals. Now, maybe you're thinking, why are you making such a big deal about this? Ahab's primary concern is for the horses and mules in this country. Now, he's got a nation full of thirsty people, of starving women and children. Why is he worried about the horses and mules? because the horses and mules are integral to his army. They are a sign of his military might. He is worried that the nations around Israel will see Israel's weakness, that this is the moment to attack, that Moab, who pays them tribute, will rise up in rebellion against them at this critical moment. Perhaps he's been planning to raid other countries for food and water. 
His trust, his trust is in man's strength to deliver him. You see, he's got a godless heart. We've already seen that in his life, how he pushed God out of society. You remember the the words of chapter 16 and verse 30? He did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all the kings who were before him. This is a godless man with a godless heart. And throughout the Old Testament, trusting in horses for deliverance is a symbol of someone not seeking God, but trusting instead in man. Let me give you a couple of examples. Psalm 20, verse 7. Uh, It's written there, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Or Psalm 33, in verse 17. There the writer says, a horse is a vain hope for salvation even its great strength cannot save. Or Isaiah 30 and verses 15 to 16, and they're God's people who are going to go into exile are warned, well, that in quietness and trust you ought to have been, but God says you were not willing. Instead, you said, no, we will flee upon our horses. We will ride upon swift steeds. Here is a godless man, and he is seeking deliverance in man's strength, in military might. Wouldn't you think that the famine would have woken him up? Wouldn't you think that God's way of shaking this nation would have gotten through to him by now? But if anything, it's hardened him towards God. Now he is actively pointing his finger at God and his prophet. Look at verse 17 with me. When Ahab saw Elijah as they eventually come together, Ahab said to him, Is it you, you troubler of Israel? It's your fault that this has happened. And you're God's representative. And so basically what I'm saying is it's God's fault that this has happened. How could God treat us like this? Now, maybe you think, well, that's not really what he's saying. Is he not just saying Elijah was talking about this, praying about this? But what did Elijah say to him when he came before him? When we met Elijah in in chapter 17 and verse 1. Ask the Lord, the God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall be neither Jew nor reign these years except by my word. As God's word says, that's what Elijah was preaching to him. And now, Ahab, who has rejected God all these years and want nothing to do with him, ironically, at the moment of crisis, is pointing the finger of blame at God. And there are many people in society, just like that today. They don't want anything to do with God. They push him away. They reject his laws. They don't, they remove him from our society. They uh, don't listen to the fact that he's got authority over them. But when something goes wrong, where was God? Where's your God now, Christians? How could a good God let this happen? If you say God's all-powerful, why did he allow this to happen? How could a God of love do this? Now, there's two applications there, I think. Well, there's many applications, but there's two I want to draw our attention to. The first is that perhaps you're not a Christian tonight. And Ahab had been leading Israel further away from God. And this famine that God sent was supposed to wake him up, was supposed to shake the nation, supposed to remind him of his need of God, but it's had the opposite effect. Why? Because he has pushed God's truth repeatedly away. Perhaps, perhaps that describes you this evening. You've been living a life that's sliding further and further away from God. Perhaps like Ahab, you know about God. You've been brought up in a Christian home. You know lots of Christian truth, but the direction of travel in your life, if you're being honest, is further and further into godlessness. 
But now a crisis has hit our whole country. Coronavirus is here. It ought to wake you up. It's supposed to shake you. It ought to make you see your need of God. But, but, if you push God and his truth away, it will have the opposite effect on you. And there is a danger that if you have gotten into a habit of pushing God's truth away, that your heart will become hardened to it. Our middle child, Ezra, every time he gets into the bath, no matter what temperature that we've been really careful to get the water to, he will say, it's burning, it's burning. Why? Well, it's not really because uh, the water's burning him. It's because he wants the cold tap on so we can splash around in it and have some fun. He likes the crack of having the water flowing. I think you could honestly put him in something that's not far off, an ice bath, and he'd be saying, it's burning, it's burning, and I want the tap on. He's gotten into the habit of wanting that tap on, no matter what the temperature is like, no matter what the water feels like, it's burning, he says, it's burning. And you know, you can get into that habit with God's Word. No matter how it comes to you, no matter how clearly it's speaking into your life, no matter how obviously it's pointing its finger at something in your life, you push it away. It's burning. It's too hot. I don't want to hear it. You dilute it with excuses, or you reason it away with objections, or you simply set yourself and say, I'm not going to believe it. And Christian brothers and sisters, that brings us to the second application under this heading. How we need to pray for people like Ahab and for people who have pushed God away that he in his grace would open their eyes to the glorious light of the gospel that they would see as we once by God's grace were brought to see their need of the Savior. We need to humble our hearts and pray for that. What else can we do but pray? You remember that when Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration with his disciples, when he returned, the disciples who hadn't gone up that mountain with him had been trying to drive out demons from a person. They'd just seen this happen recently but they couldn't do it. And they asked Jesus why. And Jesus said, these can only come out by prayer and fasting. And how, brothers and sisters, we need God to come and touch the Ahabs of this world, people who are blaming God, and how we need to pray that God would do that. So here's a man who is doubting God, a king who is blaming God. Thirdly, see a prophet, a prophet representing God, a prophet representing God. I want you to see how courageous Elijah's defense of his God is. I want you to notice two things in particular. Firstly, I want you to see why Elijah confronts Ahab. Why Elijah confronts Ahab? Well, Ahab says, is it you, you troubler of Israel? And Elijah answers, verse 18, I have not troubled Israel, but you have, and your father's house, because you have abandoned the commandments of the Lord and followed the Baals. Who's the real troubler of Israel, Elijah says? It's not me, it's not God, but it's you, Ahab, and it's your father's house. This is what my Old Testament professor used to call in-your-face preaching, isn't it? There's a contrast to Obadiah there. Obadiah who has become fearful of Ahab. Obadiah who doesn't want to bring God's word to Ahab. In Elijah's eyes, Ahab is small and God is big. What did he say to Obadiah? Verse 15, as the Lord of hosts lives, Before 
whom I stand. Literally, in the original language, before whose face I am. This, brothers and sisters, is the secret to Christian courage. It's knowing that we stand before Almighty God. It's knowing that our lives are lived in His presence, before His face, that there is none other but Him, that He is the Lord of hosts, the one who is mighty and powerful, and that we stand before Him, and that therefore we are called to simply be faithful to Him, to do as He says, to go, show yourself to Ahab verse 1, and I will send rain upon the earth. This is why Elijah confronts Ahab. He's got a big view of God. His mind is filled with truth about God. God is the Lord of hosts to him, and the reality of God is real to him. He is living life before God's face. And this is how we get courage in the Christian life. We come into the presence of God. We spend time communing with God. We know, we know that we are living life before the face of God. But I want you to see, secondly, how, how Elijah confronts Ahab. And I want you to see here that it is all about God. It's all about God. What does he say in verse 18? You have abandoned the commandments of the Lord, and you have followed the Baals. This is illustrated in the contrast between how Jezebel has treated the prophets of the Lord, she has put them to death, and how she's treated the prophets of Baal, verse 19. The 450 prophets of Baal, the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table, 850 prophets at her table, feasting at the state's expense in fellowship and relationship with Jezebel. This is what you've done, Ahab. You've rejected God, you've pushed his commandments away, and you've embraced a godless religion. You're in league with the Baal. You see, he points out God's standards to Ahab. And then he warns Ahab of God's judgment. Verse 19, Now therefore send and gather all Israel to me at Mount Carmel and the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah. God is coming in judgment, Ahab. It's going to be a public judgment. Gather all Israel before me. It's going to be a judgment where God is seen to be supreme over all of the so-called gods of this pagan religion. Now, when you see how God-centered, how God-centered his preaching is, true preaching is God-centered. It calls people to account for how they have broken and fallen short of God's standards, for how their lives have fallen far short of God's commands. And it warns people of God's judgment to come. Now just think about this for a moment. Elijah is in a time of national crisis. And in a time of national crisis, the, the temptation for preachers is to focus on symptoms, on the famine, how awful this must have been, how long it's been going on, how deep it's run in Samaria, it's severe in Samaria, how hard it must have been, how the church can help practically. Now, I'm not saying those things aren't important, but notice that Elijah begins, he begins with God, because true preaching begins with God. Those symptoms, those other things are important, but they flow out of knowing who we are before God. God's standards, God's character, God's uniqueness, God's glory, and therefore his right to be worshipped. So much of preaching and evangelism in our day and age focuses on man. It begins with man. 
Now, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying, I'm not trying to draw a false dichotomy. I'm not trying to say that we don't need to focus on man. Of course, preaching needs to have application. Of course, it must. It must meet the needs of man. But it can only meet the needs of men when it begins with God and who we are before the Lord of hosts, the living God, the one before whom we stand. And as Elijah warned Ahab, so I have to warn you this evening if you're not a Christian. Ahab had rejected God. And God would be vindicated. And his prophets would be vindicated on Mount Carmel. It would be a public, an open vindication before all of Israel. And one day, one day, God will be vindicated from every finger of blame that is pointed at him. And it won't just be before all of Israel. It will be before every creature in this universe. And if you're not a Christian, then I have to remind you that like Ahab, you have abandoned, you have abandoned the commandments of your maker. Like Ahab, you have followed other gods and he calls you to return to him for now is the day of grace. You see, wonderfully, now is the day of grace. Now is the opportunity to come and return to God. To listen to his voice, not through a prophet like Elijah, but in his word. Now is the day to see God's love for sinners who have rejected his commandments and followed other gods displayed in his Son. whom he has sent to this earth for rebels like that. Jesus, who has come to earth to make a way for sinners to return to God. Jesus, whose preaching began in the same way as Elijah's. Mark 1, verse 14, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. But Jesus, who came to bring grace and truth to sinners like us, have you come to the Lord Jesus Christ? And dear Christian friend, uh, as we close tonight, uh, I want to bring you back just for a moment to Pur Obadiah. What a lovely man he was. But here he is doubting and troubled. I feel for him, you know, as I see him in these pages. And uh, maybe that's you this evening. You're doubting and you're troubled. And I want to leave you with the words of Elijah in verse 15. As the Lord of hosts lives. Our lives are before his face. He is our God. He is on our side. We don't need to doubt. We don't need to doubt. We need to believe. And as we sit and commune with him through his word and as we draw near to him in prayer, he graciously fills us with courage to speak and live like Elijah for him in this dark world which is turned away from him. He gives us the courage to speak his truth. And we pray that many would turn to him. Amen. And may God bless his word to our hearts. Well, let's sing again to God's praise from a psalm as we close our service together.
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Well, thank you for joining with us this evening. We trust that we've been blessed as we've considered God's word together. And we look forward to joining again together on Wednesday at 8 for Bible study and prayer. And again on Friday at 11 for our Friday devotional.